This happened to me two to three years ago. I was around 23 at the time. I am a female and I live in Romania. One night I was coming home from class. Master, classes after 6 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. at around 11 p.m. I had to take the subway for about 12 stops. The destination I had to get off at was at the end of the line for the subway. At the time, there wouldn't be many people in the subway. I'm a pretty lonely person. All I need is my headset and my music and I'm good to go. Said and done, I plug in my music, pick the furthest chair in the subway, away from the only two people that were taking the subway with me at that time. So far, so good. Until I see, with the corner of my eye, a silhouette approach me and sit right next to me. It was a man, fairly built, dark hair, wearing glasses, a black shirt with a black hoodie and a sickening smile. He doesn't engage in talking with me, but would just stare at my phone as I would browse through my music. I can hear him breathing heavily, not like painfully, but still like he was feeling something very strong. I feel uneasy, so I decide to change my seat and go even further behind, trying to avoid him without looking like a freak myself. I don't know to whom, there was just another person with us the whole way. I guess that scared me even more. I pick a new chair, sit down, plug my headset again, and proceed with the remaining stops on my way home. I see the silhouette growing bigger and bigger and a breeze running on my skin as I realize the guy is again sitting right next to me glancing in mid-air, dead eyes, a big smile, staring right into my phone. I panic. There are still four stops to go. I have nowhere to hide. I look after the other person in the subway, trying to sit next to her, thinking that strength comes in numbers. She is no longer there. I start shaking a bit, but not allowing the creeper to notice me being vulnerable. I stand up, go to the door, and just decide to stand until my stop comes. This way he won't sit next to me, right? Wrong. He comes straight after me, sits on my chair right near the door, and because he couldn't see my phone, on which he was so focused so far from that angle, he fixates on me right in my soul with his black dead eyes and says, Hi gorgeous, why are you avoiding me? I'm freaking out as I look at my phone trying to call my boyfriend or message him and he stops me by saying, I know no one will help you. You would have sent an SOS message by now and I know you didn't. That moment that I realize I'm cornered, he's been focusing on my phone to see who I was talking to, trying to figure out if I panic, trying to see if I would ask someone for help. He cornered me bad. I had the luck to reach my stop as I would delay any reaction or ignore him so that he would repeat whatever he wanted to say. I drop off and run for the exit, not looking back. I get out at the surface and I don't see him anymore. At this moment, I put my phone in my purse and realize I had pepper spray with me all along. My heartbeat comes back to normal as I know I at least have something to defend myself with, but still a long way to get home and who knows if he is alone or not. I walk rather fast for maybe five minutes from the metro and feel a hand grab my wrist hard, pulling me back, another hand covering my mouth, disabling me from screaming my lungs out. It was him. The same black hoodie, dark eyes, and dead eyes stalker. He was furious and said, Running from me? How dare you run away from me? You should be honored I give you attention. Now I'm fairly built for a woman. 80 kilograms and 1.75 meters tall, so I guess he thought men don't find me beautiful or something and should feel blessed a creep like him stalks me and tries to hurt me. Now my phone is in my bag. I can't call the police. I can't reach for the pepper spray. I panic. I can't punch him in the crotch, I can't scratch him as I don't have long nails, his hand is still on my mouth. What do I do? I did the most desperate and disgusting thing I could think of just to save my life. I played along. I use my other hand to touch the inside of his thigh and mumble, I'm sorry, while his hand was on my mouth. 
He took his hand off my mouth and I repeated that I'm sorry. I didn't realize he was just flirting. He left his guard down and took his hand off my wrist. He asked me for my phone number and address to drop me off, but I refused saying I'd rather add him on Facebook and he agreed. I told him I'd reach for my phone but instead picked up the pepper spray and got him sprayed all over his face, made sure I'd cover both eyes, nose, mouth, even his ears and hands. He was instantly all red, suffocating from the pepper and swelling. I called the police, told them what happened and what I did. They asked me if he is immobilized and I said yes as the effect wears off in 45 minutes. The police arrived there five minutes later to see me shaking like a leaf and a man on the ground, swollen like a pumpkin, throwing up and swearing at me between gasps of breath. He was arrested and the police told me they had been looking for him for the past week as they discovered the body of a 24-year-old woman in his apartment. A fairly built lady, 1.77 meters tall, 75 kilograms, red hair. I have red hair too. The woman was his girlfriend and ever since, he's never gotten back to the apartment. I don't know what he wanted to do with me. I can understand why he targeted me due to the similarities, but stranger in the subway stalking women at midnight trying to befriend them or even worse. I hope to God you never ever get out of jail. This story happened when I was 12 years old. I'm a female and 25. The story I'm about to tell you might not be as scary to most, but for me and my parents it was. I remember it was a Saturday night around 9 or 10 p.m. during the summertime. I owned one dog at the time, his name was Benny. My parents decided that night that they feel like going for a walk around the block, walking Benny and asked me whether I wanted to join them. I said no because I wanted to play PWI on my PC, Perfect World International. My parents were okay with leaving me alone since the walk wouldn't take longer than 30 minutes tops. As my parents would get dressed to leave the house, I logged in PWI and looked around in my guild and global chat to see if anyone was on. For some reason, no one was, so I decided to join my parents. I get dressed, I put Benny on his leash, and we all leave. I'd like to mention that I lived in an apartment building that had 10 floors and we lived on the very first floor. Not sure how to explain, but you have the basement of the building and then the first row of apartments. Basically, you enter the building and are already facing apartments. I lived on the very first one. I remember always hating that because whoever would pass by our door, we would hear them at any time of the day or night. Whoever was lurking at night, we would hear them. It was somewhat eerie to live on floor zero. We leave the house. My dad closes the door. We had three keyholes and a steel bar that would lock the door from the inside. The bar covered half of the door. Precautions were my father's obsession. We exit the building and enjoy our walk. After 15 minutes, we realize the wind has changed from warm summer wind to incoming storm wind. My mom makes the call to go back home as Benny already did all his duties, so we all return. We open the building door, climb the five stairs to our door and attempt to open it. And my father does the following unlocks the first three locks and then attempts to unlock the metal bar that holds the door locked. At that moment, my father pauses, turns around at us with the most serious face I've ever seen on him and whispers us to call the police and ring the neighbor's door. My mom goes to the second apartment and the neighbor, who I'll call Ted, comes out asking my father what happened. My dad whispered to him covering the see-through hole of the door, Someone's in her house. He or they are holding the door. Please stay here with my family and I'll attempt to open it. I'll be back. After saying that, I see my father rush all by himself around the building in the dark. I say dark because we didn't have a street light on the side of the apartment facing the block garden. My dad disappeared into the darkness. I go outside too, not following him too much, but only to hear if he's in trouble. He's my dad. Don't judge me. As soon as I get out, I hear him shout, 
Hey, you. Come back. Who do you think you are? I called the police. At the same time I hear him shout, I look at Ted, who manages to open the door and enter the house. I go after them and enter my house. It no longer felt like my house. In just 15 minutes, while we were walking, the home invaders made a complete mess of our place. All our shelves and wardrobes were pulled out, our clothes scattered all over the house. Benny's dry food was all over the floor, indicating they must have tripped in his bowl, probably not knowing we owned a dog. But what scared me most was how organized they were. I say they because after seeing the disaster that was left behind, we knew it was impossible for just one person to hold the door, steal, and organize what they would want to take with them. I say organized because the thieves put in our living room all packed and ready what they wanted but couldn't steal. On the couch they placed our laptops, one of our TVs, my father's collection of coins, our phones, chargers, wallets, and even my father's camera. He's a photographer and that week he had to attend a wedding. They didn't have enough time to steal all of that so they just settled with some of my mom's jewelry and some pocket money. After seeing this and my silly child mine, I rushed to my room to check my piggy bank. I always saved up money from whatever chores I did. It wasn't much, but it was my work and savings, and at the time, I thought they stole it too. When I entered my room, I see the metal bars covering my windows are cut open and my window broken. This is how they entered. Through my room. My room is the only room facing the side of the building and the one most secluded from view. Needless to say, I never felt safe in my own room in which I had to live for the next ten years of my life until I moved in with my fiancé. The police arrive. They start throwing white dust. I have no idea what that is still to this day. All over our house to find fingerprints. They take pictures, take our statements, analyze my room and window. They were unable to catch the home invaders, but were able to tell us that this invasion was not the only one in our neighborhood. During that month, another four houses were broken into, one of them being the home of a cop, not related to the cops at our home. They told us that the invaders analyzed their victims, learned their schedule, even knew where their children's rooms were as they seemed to be entering the house through the children's windows. All the families affected by them had children. They did not expect us to be back that soon and panicked. Hence, one of them was holding the door with his body so that the others could flee. The person after which my dad was shouting was probably the one holding the door and escaping last through my broken window. I don't know what could have happened if I didn't change my mind and give up on raiding for gears and PWI. I would probably have come face to face with these invaders. I'm happy I didn't and I hope to God I never meet them. Ever. My uncle is considered to be an explorer in my family. He loves to travel, so much that he'll venture to the strangest or most dangerous countries in order to fulfill his very long bucket list. So in 1991, after the Soviet Union fell and travel restrictions began to dissolve, he jumped at the chance to go. He used all of the money he'd been saving, as well as some sophomore year college funds to be able to buy the plane ticket, despite the disapproval of his mother. Knowing she couldn't stop him from going, she bought him a special pouch which was able to hold his passport, money, and other important documentation. The reason she liked this pouch so much is because it was supposed to be placed under the clothing, specifically below belt area of the individual's jeans. This made it so the person could hide important items to deter pickpocketing or overall theft. He disliked the pouch, insisting he would use his small backpack with an assortment of travel items, saying it would be much better than a hidden pouch. So after much arguing, he hesitantly took the pouch with him. This becomes important later in the story. When he arrived at the Domo de Dovo Moscow airport, he noticed he was attracting some very disgruntled, mean glares from some of the people around him. He also noticed that any time an official would check his passport, they would always look at him like he was crazy for visiting. After going through various customs and random checks, he finally was released into the city, making sure to store his passport in the pouch he so reluctantly took. 
After exploring Moscow for the rest of the day, he finally made it to the small, dainty-looking hotel. Describing it as, if there were strong winds, this place could have easily fallen over. After checking in, he decided he wanted the savory taste of Russian vodka, so he sat at the small hotel bar, asking for a drink in very bad Russian. As the bartender poured his vodka, a well-dressed man, one seat over, looked at my uncle up and down with curiosity and then laughed. Need to work on your Russian, mate. This man clearly had an Australian accent. My uncle looked at him with excitement and surprise. This man was the first person he's met that spoke perfect English and didn't give a nasty glare. You're from Australia, I take it. The man looked at his drink. That's right. Bloody glad I am. I have to say, you got balls coming here. He chuckled. I don't like Americans very much. My uncle, of course, knew this. Russians and Americans did not get along quite well, especially after the Soviet Union fell, but that didn't stop my uncle from traveling to Russia. Do they glare at you? My uncle asked. The man looked at him and smiled. Not at all. Once they hear my accent, they go back to whatever they're doing. The man picked up his drink, swirling it a little, then asked, I'm assuming you've heard a Canadian accent before. Puzzled, my uncle responded with the affirmative. The man finished his drink with a gulp and set the glass cup on the table. I highly suggest you start using a Canadian accent from now on. You just scream fresh meat with your American accent. The man got up from his seat and sighed. My name's Bryce, by the way. I'll be around. Hopefully we will meet again. <laughs> Bryce then picked up his belongings and headed towards one of the elevators. My uncle thanked him for the advice and finished his drink as well. While getting up, he noticed the bartender staring at him blankly. My uncle found this odd, but shook it off since everyone was giving him looks. He headed for his room and went to bed. When he woke up, the first thing he noticed was the window to his room was cracked. So cracked that if he put a little pressure on the glass, it would have shattered. This freaked him out, enough to take all of his stuff with him for the day, leaving nothing behind. My uncle finally ventured out for the day and wanted to visit a museum nearby. One of the hotel staff suggested for him to take a shortcut through an alleyway instead of walking the main city streets, since it takes less time. While walking, he heard footsteps behind him, but... It didn't sound like it was just one person walking, it sounded like multiple. My uncle decided to discreetly look behind him, as he didn't want to be rude as a foreigner. He saw four men walking behind him, keeping a short distance. Three of the men were much bigger than him, but one of them was much smaller and looked familiar. The largest man was bald, the other large man was obtuse. The third largest wore a bright red hat, and the smallest, well, the only distinguishing feature was that he was small. Zin! One of them yelled at him in a very deep, slurred voice. This startled my uncle as the voice sounded so hostile. However, he didn't understand what it meant, so he continued to walk, speeding up his pace. The man continued to scream this in a hostile manner very slurred and sometimes incomprehensible. My uncle realized that this man was most likely drunk, and if he was drunk, the probability of all four of them being drunk was also very high. When making this conclusion, my uncle decided he needed to get out of that alleyway immediately, as he did not want to speak with a group of large drunk men. Before he could look back again to see how far behind they were, he felt a strong, painful grip on his shoulder and before he knew it, he was thrown against the wall. Disoriented from the impact, he attempted to get back on his feet quickly in order to try to escape the situation. The largest man grabbed his shirt collar and lifted him up, pinning him on the wall. This man looked very angry and stunk of alcohol, similar to the other three men that surrounded him, the smaller one holding a large bottle of booze. When he looked at the smaller one, that's when it hit him. It was the bartender from last night. The one gripping his shirt collar moved closer to his face and slurred, 
looked at me when I'm talking to you. Terrified, my uncle stared at him. The obtuse man looked my uncle up and down an inch closer. He smelled like burnt cigarettes mixed with a strong alcohol odor. I like your backpack, comrade, the man garbled. Where did you get it? Great, my uncle thought. I'm going to be robbed. The largest man tightened his grip and pushed him harder into the wall and screamed, Answer him when he's talking to you. In the best Canadian accent my uncle could conjure up, he stammered, Oh, this, uh, oh, uh, I got it as a gift, uh, from my mom. He was shaking at this point, he was so scared. Canadian, are you? The man with the bright red hat asked. He leaned forward and sniffed my uncle. I'm surprised you don't smell like maple. All of them laughed at the joke. My uncle stayed silent, proceeding to look at the bartender for help. The bartender, who seemed to be the most drunk out of everyone, pointed at him and shouted, I don't believe you. You're an American, aren't you? I know it, you liar. I heard you before. You're not a Canadian. I know you're an American, you freaking liar. No, no. The obtuse slurred, looking at the bartender. His passport. Look at his passport. Then he looked at my uncle's backpack. The larger man holding him pulled him forward with tight grip. While doing so, the obtuse man ripped the backpack off my uncle's shoulders. Afterward, the large man threw him against the wall. Harder than the first time, my uncle's head was throbbing at this point. The men started to angrily search his bag, throwing his clothes and other necessities on the wet, icy concrete, ruining most of my uncle's belongings. Where is it? The man with the red hat roared. The passport! Where's the passport? My uncle continued to speak with a Canadian accent. Oh, uh, it's, uh, it, it should be in there, I swear. The bartender broke the bottle of alcohol on the wall, spraying the liquid everywhere. He held the sharp, broken end of the bottle close to my uncle, saying, Say you're an American. Say it. I know you're lying. Say it. My uncle just stared at the sharp edges of the bottle. What was he supposed to say? He stood there, frozen in fear. Before the bartender could scream any more absurdities, all of them heard someone scream, Oi! The five of them, including my uncle, turned towards the owner of the voice. It was Bryce. The largest man stood up tall, clearly towering over Bryce. You don't know who you're messing with, comrade. Bryce laughed. All of them, except the largest man, stared at him with awe. Even my uncle was dumbfounded. Who would laugh at someone clearly more threatening? Bryce looked at the large man and said, You're right, mate. I don't. He pulled his coat back, revealing a gun. The larger man put his hands up and started to back up, the others following their leaders. You, know, you might find it in your best interest to leave. The four men just stood there frozen, all keeping their sights fixed on the gun. Bryce's facial expression changed as he looked at all four of them with a stone-cold expression. Now... All of them pivoted and quickly sped walked away, the obtuse one still carrying the backpack. Once they were out of sight, Bryce quickly ran over to my uncle and proceeded to pick up all of the items and put them in a pile. He then held out his hand and lifted my uncle from the alcohol-stained wall. So tell me, Bryce met my uncle's surprised stare. Really, where is your passport? My uncle shakily took out the small travel pouch his mother bought him, unzipped, and showed a small corner of his American passport. Ah, Bryce smiled and began to laugh. That thing may have just saved your life. I would say that I live in one of the most unsafe cities in the U.S., that being Chicago. Although the south side where I live has a lot of crime, I live in a community that consists of a lot of police officers and firemen, so I have the luxury of not being constantly concerned for my safety. 
From time to time, people wander in from the surrounding less safe neighborhoods to rob or rough up some kids, but it is far and few between. For reference, I live in a really small house that I rent. I'm a 21-year-old female. Along with my two younger sisters and my mom live here alone. Occasionally, I will have my boyfriend over, but it is rare that men enter our house and we have a dog. Around April, my mom tells me that her and my sister saw a man walking up and down the block with a black hood up and I should be on the lookout. My mom grew up in one of the bad neighborhoods of Chicago and as a result, she is often paranoid about dumb stuff, so I just ignored it. The next day, I pull up to the front of my house and I see a man in a black hood standing next to my neighbor's garbage cans. I can't see his face, but he has a bigger build and around an average height. He had a bag with him and you can tell he was just trying to seem normal. As soon as I saw him, I got a huge sinking feeling in my stomach and I felt nervous. Luckily, my boyfriend was with me and he started to briskly walk away as we were exiting the car. I tell my mom and she gets more freaked out. In this rush to leave, this man left the bag that he had with him. As I look inside, I could see a bunch of snacks, some half-eaten and some unopened. This creeped me out. What was this guy doing? Eating snacks and watching my family? Fast forward a couple of hours and it's dark now. My mom is thoroughly paranoid, so she keeps looking out the window to make sure that this guy isn't creeping around anymore. At about 8, I hear her scream for my boyfriend and I to look out the window. We come running over and look out to see the black hood guy across the street staring directly at our house. He has his hands deep in his pockets and he is clearly looking into the house. My mom calls 311, the non-emergency number to report it. As the cops pull up, the man walks fast down the alley. I figured that an innocent person would just stay and talk to the police. The fact that he keeps hiding his face and running when people see him has now sufficiently scared me. As the night goes on, we continue to see this man walking or staring into our house. We keep calling the police to report it and every time they show up, he evades their questioning by walking or running away. This goes on until 2 a.m. and the police eventually tell us they'll keep circling. The next day we see the man walking around our house again and staring into it. At some point the neighbors start to notice too and they call the police as well. After a week of this guy, he eventually stopped coming around. I'm so thankful for my neighbors who made him feel watched and therefore leave. Now I'm always worried when I come home late at night or that he may be following me. After all, the hood prevented me from seeing his face. For all I know, he might be following me in the public and I have no idea. All I can say is that he has definitely made me hyper aware of my surroundings. I am Indian and I have been living in the capital city of Delhi for 12 years. In 2014, I had joined the University of Delhi. I was very happy and excited as I really wanted to join the university for a long time. When I had started my college there, there was this senior in my department who had started talking to me. Me being a naive 18 year old was very interested in talking to him even if my intuition was screaming that I should not. Within six months of meeting this guy, he proposed to me. I was very excited and I said yes. I was on cloud nine. My parents were really against this person and would always tell me to stay away. Stupid me thought that my parents were just being paranoid. Soon the honeymoon period was over and I started realizing that he is a very controlling person and somehow he had managed to pry me away from my friends as he started badmouthing me behind my back, which I found out way later. He started forcing me to become physical with him and I would refuse point blank. He started becoming more and more angry with me as I was not giving him what he wanted. I started feeling suffocated in the relationship, so I decided the best course of action was to break up with him, and that is what I did, and that did not go down well with him. 
Within a week of our breakup, he contacted me again and sent me an edited picture of which I was completely naked, and I was horrified. What he said later scared me even more. He said that if I don't give him what he wanted, he'll begin circulating all the pictures that he had edited among all the people of my department. I was scared. He said he wanted a physical relationship and wanted me to move out of my parents' house. I was really scared and showed all the messages to my parents, and they managed to contact his parents and told them to keep him away from me, and I blocked him on all the social media platforms. I was really happy for some time. All these events had taken place in my first year of college. When my second year started, I realized he had said horrible things about me and most of my classmates were very hostile towards me. I really loved my course and the only thing I did was go to college and come back. I was miserable. Soon I saw that my ex Anna's brother had started to follow me on my way home in the bus that I took to go home as the route I took was exactly in the opposite direction of his house's. I ignored this occurrence once or twice thinking that he might be going the same route as me to meet someone but when he started doing this at regular intervals I got scared and told my dad about it. So the next day of college I was told to inform my dad when I left the college and he sent his driver to the bus stop from where I got my bus and confronted the guy about his intentions and fortunately the guy ran away. But he created a fake profile and got a new number and started contacting me again. And my parents were told and they were beyond angry. They filed a case against him and his family was also incredibly angry at us. They would try and harass me on social media. Because of all the proof I had, he got a restraining order and had to sign an affidavit that he or any of his family members could not contact me directly or indirectly and that he would delete all the photos and could not talk about me, be it positive or negative. This incident affected me so badly that I had to be hospitalized for two months and had to take antidepressants and mood stabilizers for over a year. This incident happened in July of 2018. I was 15 at the time and my two cousins, brother and I were tubing with our parents. This story isn't particularly scary, it's just weird and shocking to all of us. For the first few hours of the day, nothing really seemed to catch us off guard. It wasn't until our last time tubing down the stream when we started to get a bad feeling about everything. My cousin, who I'll call Charlie, saw a man near the shore where we would get off. For some context, this guy was around 5'7", and he was wearing overalls and work boots. When I first saw this guy, both Charlie and I saw many red flags. When we were about 10 feet away from passing the man, he turned and looked at us. I told Charlie to get up and start heading upstream, and we told our brothers to go with us. We were running up the river and carrying our heavy tubes, looking back at the old man inching closer and closer to us. As this fishing pole, holding full, was just about to catch up to us, I saw my mother in the distance as we continued running up the stream. As soon as she saw this dumb man running behind us, she said, What are you doing running after my kids? He stumbled back and started to stutter. But just after my mom scolded him, he just took off upstream and we never saw him again. Everyone who witnessed this experience happened to all agree that the man chasing us may have fact been insane. Everyone, please remember to watch your surroundings. You never know how crazy such a normal person can be. I'm a 16 year old female and I'm new to Reddit as I only got it about 5 minutes before writing this. I currently live in a small town in West Yorkshire. I lived in Germany for the past 4 years when my father was a soldier in the army, but since he has left, we came back to my parents' hometown. Living here is quiet. You get the occasional row between teenagers and the odd one or two drunk members that cause havoc in the street. Point being, 
barely anything happens here. That's why I didn't expect what happened to me at all. I was coming back from my now ex-boyfriend's house in one of the next small towns over which was about a 20 minute bus ride away. Since there was no buses back from his town, I had to get one all the way back to the bigger town over just to make it back on a different bus to my own hometown. Once I had made it back to my town, I had missed the last bus back to my house and had to settle for a taxi. This wasn't a problem as the taxi base was located right next to the bus station. After making my way to the taxi base, I was informed that I would have to wait at least 10 minutes for a taxi as they were busy. As I waited on the sofa they had in the building, I tried distracting myself by listening to my music but overheard a man screaming loudly on the phone. I assumed he was drunk and waited patiently for the woman to end the phone call. I asked her, what was that all about? And she gave me an exhausted look and said, it's this guy wanting a taxi home but he's really angry and very drunk and waiting at the chippy down the road. I didn't know how to respond so I asked who it was as we are a tight community and everybody knows everybody. She tells me it's this man who I'm going to refer to as Harry. I knew of Harry as he was a well known troublemaker in the area and I told her this. I also told her that he lived across the street from my house. The woman realized this and asked me if I don't mind sharing a taxi with him. At first I was hesitant but if it would get me home faster than sure. I know this was a stupid mistake as I realize now. Harry, instead of waiting at the chippy, decides to come to the taxi base and right on time when the taxi pulls up. I jump in the back wanting to go home after a long day and he climbs in the front in his drunken state. I thought to myself, here we go. As I stuck my earphones in to distract myself, I am yet again disrupted by... Harry screaming down the phone. He is shouting at what seems to be his girlfriend who was also waiting outside the taxi base for him in a grey mini. As he is swearing and screaming I look behind us and notice that the grey mini is tailgating the taxi. At this point I start to worry and get nervous as I had no clue of the situation at hand or how to deal with it as I was no part of the incident that they had started for themselves. As we pull up to the shop outside my house, I pay for the taxi. Yeah, I know, so gentlemanly of me to pay, right? He steps out of the taxi and crosses the road. At this point, who I assume to be his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend steps out of the mini. She shouts Harry's name in a very aggressive and angry tone. As I'm crossing the road to go to my house, she targets me. I, frozen in fear by this clearly drugged up or drunk woman screaming at me, slowly back up towards my house. I am nowhere near the front door and end up getting cornered between the front of my house and a sign that is used for the shop. This clearly insane woman, we'll call her Claire, comes running at me from the mini that had been screeched to a halt on the white lines in the middle of the road, afterwards screaming, Who are you? She comes across to me, belting it down the street. All I can think of doing is protecting myself and my belongings. On me I had a bag, my phone in my hand, at least 10 pounds in cash and some makeup in my bag. While trying to protect my items and myself, she is coming at me and beating me in the back of the head and smashing my skull up against the wall of my house. I announced to this clearly crazy woman that I did not know Harry and that I was 16 years old. She heard me and carried on. And this is when it gets scary. She starts hitting me so hard on the back of the head that my vision goes black. I start praying that someone will help me and stop this from happening. All the while, she has my hair gripped. She swings her fists around into my face and is repeatedly hitting me in the eyes and nose. While I'm trying to protect my head with both my hands at this point, she again smashes my head against the wall, making me instantly go dizzy. Massive chunks of flesh are ripped out of my fingers and my knuckles on both hands. I was pouring blood. All my belongings fall out of my bag, which she notices. She bends down to claim some of my property is hers. This is when I fight back. I grab her by the hair and decide to get her back. I had just been brutally beaten and scared and shocked. This woman deserves something back. 
As Claire bent down, I grabbed her by the hair hard enough to make all my acrylic nails pop off, ripping off my real nails along with them and dig into the flesh on the palm of my hand. I give her one pull backwards and two punches to the back of the skull. I shout, Give me my stuff back! And she then claims that she was picking up her glasses that she didn't have. All this time, Harry and the guy driving the Mini did nothing to help. The taxi driver just sits there watching everything go down. Later on, I found out that Harry was recording this whole incident on his phone. Just after I had let go of Claire's hair, my mother comes outside to come find me, thinking that the taxi driver kept me in the car for my own safety. When my dad finds out, being an ex-soldier, he goes insane. Me being his daughter, he goes into psycho mode. He's shouting and screaming as I am. I was in so much shock that I couldn't breathe. I was violently shaking and nearly sick. I was covered in blood and I even had some of Claire's hair under my now raised nails. Tears were rolling down my face like I had an endless supply of water stored in them. Claire and Harry then have a fight and then Harry and the guy driving the Mini have a fight too. Too much was going on and it didn't help that my parents had to keep me awake until 2am to wait for the police to take a quick statement. Fast forward to the next day. All three people have been taken into police custody where they're only legally allowed to stay for 24 hours. Harry is released but has to attend court. The guy driving the Mini is released without charge as he did attack Harry back and Claire has been released without having to go to court and isn't allowed to come within 100 meters of me or my house. I later found out that Claire had been responsible for breaking someone's jaw and collarbone not long before and also throwing herself down a flight of stairs to get herself out of trouble. Yeah, she's insane. I'm now left with permanent reminders of that night left in many forms, some being scars and mental traumas. I'm awaiting a court date soon and hopefully this woman and man will get put to justice but for now, I hope I never see them again. This has by far been the most painful and scariest experience of my life, and I hope it never happens again. I live in the UK, and when I was younger my dad moved into this rented house, which was kind of like a manor house that has been added on over the years the oldest being from about the Tudor period and the bit that we were in was Victorian. I remember the first time I looked around it. It was absolutely huge but it gave me a downright creepy vibe but I just brushed it off as a new house I wasn't familiar with. Now it's important to point out that I'm a strong believer in the paranormal. I'm kind of fascinated by it. The house was a very strange layout as the bathrooms had been added on at a later date so they were on a different level. Being upstairs, there was a small set of stairs going into the bathroom. This upstairs bathroom would always for some reason just give me the complete creeps. I don't know why, but I always avoided it. It's also important to point out that I would stay with my dad on the weekends and stay with my mom during the week. Now that's over, I can tell you what happened over the three years I was living there. As I said, this place gave me weird vibes, but I just brushed it off as a new place. For the first, I want to say, year, everything was okay. I was getting used to the weird noises the house would make in the middle of the night that at first would scare the life out of me, but you get used to those things eventually. Around this time, I started getting even more creepy vibes from the place, and I was never feeling comfortable there when I would visit. I would have random panic attacks all the time with no explanation and no trigger. At the time, my dad just brushed it off as me being in my early teens and dealing with all that fun teenager stuff. The creepiness of the place was getting worse and then the dreams started. At first, these dreams would only occur on stormy nights, especially thunderstorms. The dreams would normally consist of time travel and normally going to hell, underworlds, and alternate universes, and you would always get woken up with the roar of the thunder. It was terrifying as it kept happening more frequently even on calm nights. I eventually brought it up to my dad and he said he kept having very vivid dreams but nothing too out of the ordinary. 
I thought this was weird, as I heard before that spirits can work their way into dreams. This freaked me out, but that was nothing. In my room above the fireplace, there was these metal vents that would clatter in the wind, which is perfectly normal and never bothered me, until they started moving when there was no breeze at all, when it was completely still outside. This was very creepy, but I just thought it was my imagination being overactive. For a good year, this would keep happening and nothing else. I didn't like it, but I could live with it until it got worse. One weekend, I brought my cat to my dad's when my mom went on holiday. Now, one important thing to note about my cats is they love people and they love to explore and climb everything. The entire weekend, they were with me. They spent the entire time either hiding under the stairs, sofa, and hiding in the downstairs bathroom. Everything just got worse from there. One night I was lying in bed with the covers half over my face, and I felt somebody brush the hair out of my face, except I could feel nails, like quite long nails, and nobody in my house has nails like that. I also would feel like somebody was sitting on top of me when I was in my bed. This used to happen quite a bit, and every time it did, I would have to hold back a panic attack. Every time you were in the house, especially if the light was dim, you would have a feeling of constantly being watched, and you would find yourself looking behind you obsessively, especially upstairs in the spare bedroom and in the upstairs bathroom. It's safe to say I didn't go in either of them very often unless it was absolutely needed. If there was one corner of a room that wasn't lit up properly at night, you would occasionally see a shadow, and the feeling of being watched would get even worse. I really gave up trying to sleep in that house when one morning at about one or two-ish I was woken up by doors slamming very loudly. Too loud to be the neighbors, it sounded like it was coming from the bathroom, and then what I can describe as a moan or scream that definitely wasn't the kids next door. That's when I officially lost my mind and sanity. For another six months, the dreams, the weird noises, and the increasingly creepy vibes kept getting worse until we finally moved. I was so happy to finally get out of that house. Whatever was in there, demonic or not, definitely didn't want me in there and I really dreaded to think about what would have happened if I was still there now. The whole experience has made me a lot more aware of what paranormal activity can do whether it's just trying to get back to the real world, or if it has more evil intentions. I was a college student at the time and I needed some place to live since my parents were in a different city. I found this average house with a really good price, almost too good to be true. I contacted the owner and we planned the time I was free to come and check it out. The house was really big. Every room was huge. Even the bathroom was bigger than my parents' bedroom. I told the owner that I liked the house and I want to rent it for the next month. He agreed but told me one thing. These were his words. About three months ago I had one man live here. The first time he came I had an uneasy feeling about him. I didn't want to sell it to him, didn't want to sell him the house, but he paid double, and I really needed the money, so I accepted. A few weeks pass, and I call him, but he doesn't answer. I come to the house to check on him, but he's nowhere to be seen. I come to the kitchen, where I see a pool of blood. I quickly ran out of the house and called the cops. They check it out, but couldn't find out his location. I was shocked by his words. He understood if I didn't want to rent the house, but I couldn't find anything better, so I did rent it at the end. Many months later, I was expecting a delivery. I ordered a new big TV because the old one the house had was really bad. After I unpacked everything, I didn't have the storage to put the boxes. The idea popped in my head that the house maybe had a basement. I looked everywhere, but in the end, I called the owner and asked him. He told me that the only storage was the old shack in the backyard. I knew about that, but the shack was full. Later that day, I was in my bedroom, laying on my bed going through my gallery pictures when suddenly I see something on the ceiling. At first I thought it was a vent, but 
When I brought a chair and looked closer, I saw that it was an attic. I opened it and it was pitch black, so I used the light on my phone to see. I climbed in and after a short time of searching, I saw a light switch. When I switched it, the light turned on. The light was very bad. It barely lit up half the attic. I was beginning to climb back down when a black trash bag caught my eye. I went to the bag with my phone and tried to pick it up. It was unusually heavy for a trash bag. I gave up on the idea of picking up and decided to open it. The moment I opened it, the smell of rotten flesh and every single thing you can possibly imagine being rotten hit me in the face. I shone my light to see the bag and see a woman, a dead woman, starting to decompose. I jumped back so much that I fell through the vent opening on my back. I ran out of the house and called the cops. They began their investigation and asked me questions about the house. I called the owner and in a matter of minutes he arrived. When the police questioned me, he told them the same story about the man he told me. Turns out that he didn't even know the house had an attic. Him and the police suspected it was the victim of the same man, but lack of evidence restricted them to go any further. The owner of the house apologized to me for everything, but I just couldn't bring myself to staying in a house that someone had died in. One week later, I moved out to another apartment with my roommate and I was living there the rest of my college years. They never caught the man, and they were unable to to identify the woman. I was finally off from work and my little mini vacation was starting. I had been keeping track of the weather and made sure that the days I wanted to go on vacation would be great for some hiking and camping. I live in Altoona, Pennsylvania in the middle of the state. My role in life is to explore every state park in Pennsylvania. I decided that when I was a youngin, I would make it my life's goal to visit and write about every park I could travel to. I'm a young man, and as long as I stayed healthy and strong, I should be able to do it. There's over 111 state parks in Pennsylvania, 20 state forests, one national forest, one national memorial, two national historic sites, and three national historic parks. I've been to half of the state's forests and 30 of the state parks. I usually start at the parks on the outside of the state and work clockwise from Altoona, as the 6 o'clock position. But I have a friend who loves Black Mashannon State Park and she's always talking about how good the fishing is on the lake. She raves about the hiking and the trails and even though it's close to a highway, it's secluded enough to feel like you're in a world of your own, which is what I needed. I work at a Wawa and... I kind of hit the lottery for a decent amount of money. Not enough to retire, but enough to afford my condo, keeping up the HOA and go on vacation when I wanted to. Which is what I'm doing right now. So here we are. I'm going to head up to Moshannon and see what the fuss is all about. I woke up at about 5.30 and finished uploading the car. I got some breakfast from the job and headed up Highway 99, then cut over to Alternate 220 then on to Beaver Road as that would take me right into the middle of Black Mashannon, past the lake and to the camping grounds. Since the deer season was ending, the park's traffic would primarily be locals and the rare tourist. I got there by quarter to ten. The sun was high and the air was cooler than average for August. It felt great, good enough for a hike. After setting up camp and securing the site with a few locks, I put on my hiking gear and decided to take a few of the off-brand trails heading north. I passed the bog near Route 504. The panorama was amazing as the sun glistened off the waters by the banks, which were covered in oak, cherry, and pine trees, trees that rose up the gentle slopes of hills. I took in the fresh scent and decided after the hike I'd do lunch then get into some fishing. I hadn't seen a soul up here yet outside of some cars on the road coming in and the park ranger who guided me to my camping lot. It was about 40 minutes into my hike when I hadn't come across anything odd. I had taken pictures of some of the birds I saw and decided to make a mental note of the varieties I'd seen. There were warblers, teals, black ducks, Canadian geese, and other avian critters. 
As I crossed over a smaller bog path, I noticed a group of woodpeckers chasing a flying squirrel. Poor little critter. I said aloud to no one as I watched the aerial spat. Then a plane flew overhead reminding me that no matter how far I go, civilization was. Hmm, what's that? I noted as I heard some crunching in the grass. I noticed the chittering of the critters had moved on as they continued their conflict. I knew black bears were native to this area, so I wanted to make sure that there was a good bit of distance between me and it, just in case it decided to charge. I followed the noise of the crunching up the hill and into a nearby clearing. Moving slowly is not to startle the bear. Heck, it might not even be a bear, I thought, but deer or something else. And it was neither. It was just another hiker like myself. Well, I guess she was a hiker, but she didn't dress like one. It was a young black girl, probably late twenties, a few years older than myself, I thought. She had on a tank top with some bike shorts and sneakers. It was kind of odd as it was unseasonably cool. It was probably around 50 degrees or so, maybe a little warmer in the sunlight. She was carrying only one of those small backpack purses. She was very carefree as she walked, humming a tune and swinging the pack about as she played with the fauna. She walked to a grouping of stones and found a small tree stump and sat down. She gazed up at the sky and smiled. Man, she was cute, I thought, as she looked about. Her hair was short and styled, high cheeks, nice pouty lips with a fit athletic body, maybe only a few inches shorter than me. She pulled the pack to the front then looked inside. I guess to make sure she had what she needed here, like keys or mace or something. I thought it would be curious to at least let her know I was out here so as not to startle her. But just as I decided not to come across as a creeper looking at a chick in the woods, I felt the air temperature just drop. I shook for a quick moment as a chill went down my spine. Ooh. I said aloud, but not loud enough for her to hear me as I shivered. Must have been a breeze or something, I said to myself rubbing my arms. As I gathered myself, I noticed the sky was almost imperceptibly darker. I mean, the sun was still out, and the skies mostly clear, but it was almost like looking at the world through barely tinted sunglasses, which I was not wearing. I started making my way to her, and then I noticed her left hand. She was holding up her index finger. It, it was pointed in my direction. Had she seen me? There was no way. I was in the tree line covered in shadow, making my way around the bushes. She probably heard me curse. What? I cried as the chill returned with no breeze at all. I looked around frightened for some reason. I didn't know why, but I was scared beyond belief. I looked towards the girl. I had to warn her. But warn her of what? Me being scared lifeless for no reason? Then I noticed her finger still up, but pointing directly at me, then wagging at me, like don't come here, stay put, stay where I was. Confused, I decided to see what. Oh my god, I whispered to myself as I looked at her. Behind her, what was that? I tried to scream, but my voice died out as my eyes went wide with terror, as she just sat there not seeing the thing behind her. I tried to run, but like my voice, my legs didn't want to work. I could only watch in horror as the creature slithered much like a snake as it approached her. It rose behind her, its form like a dark, wispy, ripped, overly large and long coat. It was a cloak of floating darkness. The bottom and arms were just like shredded bedsheets draped over a corpse, as the only true feature on it was the bony deer-like antlers on its hooded and skeletal face. Moss, grass, and other detritus dangled loosely from its antlers. The skeletal face was human but overly large and its mouth a gaping pit of darkness as was its eyeless pits. A crack ran from its temple into the darkness of the hood. It reached for the girl as the pack dangled from her shoulder. No, it reached for the backpack the shredded, handless hem of where its arm should be gingerly reached for it. 
I wet myself as I knew that thing would kill her and she'd never even know it. I guess it was a blessing to die swiftly, but if it had seen me, I know how I would die. Death under a cloudless sunny day with the sounds of the woods to muffle my death cries as the animals went about their day like this was normal. To my shock, the girl pulled the backpack over her shoulder and craned her head to look behind her. You remember how you got that crease on that bony face of yours, right? She said to it with little emotion. Ah, yes, it said, raising its sleeved arm to its head. You, Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia, assaulted me without provocation, I remember. You did try to suck the life from me, if I remember correctly. She said back to the thing as if they had some rivalry or something. Did you get the items per my request? The creature said as it floated to the front to face her as it towered over the sitting woman. The bottom of its smoke-like form swayed silently about a foot off the ground, but had it been touching the ground it would probably still be at least ten feet tall. It glanced down at her. May I see it? To be sure, it is what I asked for. The demonic specter hissed in its airy breath. The girl looked to the backpack and reached inside. I could feel my legs quivering as I was both fascinated and terrified at the sight before me. My brain desperately tried to understand this whole thing. A human girl is having a conversation with some ghostly monstrosity. It's sunny and cloudless and the sounds of the forest went on as normal. I think I even heard another plane overhead as my nose took in the smell of my urine and my weak knees marinated in the stuff, too shaken to do anything else. I watched on as the girl pulled something from the bag. It looked like a brass cup and a medallion. The creature hissed in pleasure as it rose above her, its arms fluttering like some bird before it settled down again. This is what you mean, the girl said, dangling the medallion and holding the brass cup before it. The creature shrunk towards the ground in an almost kneeling position. As it did so, the front of its ethereal body began to grow in a small circular pattern about the size of the medallion. Do you also have the other thing? It said excitedly, its antlered head moving forward trying to look in the pack. She pulled it back and told it too. Take it easy, she told it, annoyed at the thing's eagerness. How long has it been? She asked it as she pulled forth another cup and a small bottle or something. The creature rose up and back as the light in the medallion dimmed some. It looked as if it was in contemplation. What human year is this now? It asked. 2019 of the Common Era, she told it. 374 of your years since I lost that. It growled, pointing to the medallion in the brass cup. Name your fee and let's be on with it. It stated, the eagerness overriding its common sense as its formless body shuddered in anticipation. I told you my fee when you made the request. That crack on the head knocked away some of your memory? She asked it, tapping her head. Are you serious? That was your fee? Not power, or influence, or money as you humans love so much. Not adoration, or some silly bargain. It said to her almost incredulously, A story. A story. She stated with a wide grin on her face. A story? I said to myself. Why something so small? Why not something of significance? The creature asked her. I too was curious about this. Because my job is to collect the history of as many things I can. I'm also a sucker for a good story. Stories are significant. I know somewhere in that spectral skull of yours you've seen and done some things. Just tell me one. She said, holding up a finger. You are 
Very curious for a human, Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia. He replied to her. How long have you been around? She asked the thing. Thousands of your years. Why? Tell me a story of something... 800, no, 1,000 years back. She stated as she placed her elbows on her knees and cupped her face like a kid at camp around a campfire. She even had the silliest grin on her face. Who was she? What was she? How could she sit around that thing like it was normal? I hadn't realized it, but I found myself sitting also on a dry patch of the ground looking on intensely. I must be suffering from brain damage or something. Fear mixed with intrigue, mixed with heightened curiosity. I too waited for the story of the thing. Very well, curious one. The story I will tell you is of a really stupid boy and his equally stupid family. The creature began. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.